Hey there, I'm Jackie Ferris. Former First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy is known for her sense of style, but it extends far beyond her clothing to the White House. Today, we are at Winter Tour to check out a brand new exhibit that explores Kennedy's work at renovating the White House with the help of H.F. DuPont. It was a relationship that was creative and complicated, but culminated in the style we now see in the White House. Get ready, the 302 is designing your way. Former First Lady Jackie Kennedy was not only a fashion icon, but she also played a big role in helping the White House become historically significant. Now there is a brand new exhibit here at Winter Tour and we're going to talk all about it. I'm joined now by Alexandra Deutsch, who is the Director of Collections. Alexandra, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you, Jackie. We are so excited to be here. This is an amazing exhibit that you guys have been working on for a little while, right? We have. We started working on it in 2019 and it was the exhibit that was the obvious thing to do in 2022 because this was the anniversary of her touring winter tour and we were such a pivotal place for this conception of how to restore the White House. Now, uh, Jackie Kennedy's fascination with the White House started at a young age. Yes. She toured the White House but was disappointed that there wasn't a guidebook. Yes. So when she became the resident at the White House, she, I guess, decided that she really wanted to make things significant because she didn't find significance there, right? Right. She essentially found what she considered almost department store level furniture. And she, who had this great love of France and had this experience abroad, saw the great European capitals having these stately residences that represented the powers of those countries. And so to her, the White House was a really shabby representation of the world's greatest power in the United States. So her vision was to really elevate it and also make it a place for history and a place that everyone could be educated about American history. So I guess, how did she go about, about it? She created this uh, commission, this committee? She did. So she was a very strategic person. And looking to H.F. DuPont, who at that time was known as the founder of Winterthur and really the preeminent expert on American decorative arts, she knew that she could bring a gravitas to this undertaking, which was a restoration, not a redecoration. And bringing H.F. DuPont into the project at this very early stage and kicking it off with a, vin a visit to Winterthur was a way for her to set the standard of what she was intending to do so that it didn't seem like a frivolous undertaking, but that it seemed like a, a serious academic historical effort to bring the White House back to that historical integrity that it should have. I think the quote that really struck me when I started researching this was, she said it was a matter of scholarship. Yes. That it was, like you said, a, a research um, endeavor. Um, so, but talk to us a little bit about how the process came. You mentioned she came to Winter Tour to ask um, Mr. DuPont to be a part of all of this. So she comes for a tour of the house and it's kept quite private. She only comes with two other people and DuPont makes sure that there are very limited photographs. And so this wasn't an event that the press was widely covering, but she comes for the day and her background and great love was French decorative arts. So American was new to her and HF was determined to show her that you could have a really swell house with American antiques. And so she spends the day here She's absolutely captivated by it. She talks about her aspiration in retirement is that she and Jack would be gatekeepers at Winterthur. She's just mesmerized by what HF has created. But she also knew in HF that he had all the connections. He was going to help her form this committee that would oversee this restoration. And he would help guide her 
to just the right people. So people who are at the, the most prestigious institutions like the Met are going to become involved in the committee, but also the major donors, the major collectors. And so he becomes the conduit to assembling this very elite committee that ultimately will be the faces, but will be vetting in various degrees what comes into the White House. So when you take a walk through the exhibit, you see a lot of these artifacts. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, um, what we see, I guess, the, there's like a guest book that she yes. signed here, and there's a picture of her. Yes, so we at Winterthur are very fortunate to have an estate archive that is extensive, and this is the age of paper. So we have the telegrams where HF is going back and forth with Jackie and HF is going back and forth with collectors and other people who get involved with the committee. And that is all here. And so in this correspondence, you can really almost step by step retrace the beginnings of the project, HF's role in the project. And we have also borrowed from major institutions like Mount Vernon, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and other prominent collections, including private collections, to gather the material that people see. And one of the most important repositories that we relied on was the JFK Library, which has been a tremendous supporter of the project and has lent things that have never been seen before. So we're very fortunate that we were able to get things, correspondence, we were able to get the reproduction of the suit that Jackie wore yeah, for this the is CBS gorgeous. tour. Yeah. Uh, it was a copy of a French designer um, that was made based on the French original and we have the reproduction that's from the JFK library because the original is no longer exhibitable. But we really were able to give you a sense of stepping back in time, walking through the project, but also situating Winterthur at the center of what we now know to be how the White House looks. and. HF's legacy really is there still in so many of those rooms now that have been kept with this historical integrity because of Jackie's efforts. Now there is a story that a lot of people don't hear or don't know. Um, a lot of this is so fresh for people, but um, I guess she left her purse here? She did, and in fact Charles Hummel, who at the time was one of the curators at Winterthur, a young man, a graduate of the Winterthur program, he was called in at the last minute, he and his wife, to attend this dinner that took place at Winterthur to end Jackie's time here. And she, knowing that the dinner was going to extend much longer before dessert was served, she excused herself and said she had a very pressing engagement, had to get back to Washington. And when she got up, it was realized that she had left her purse on the chair. And H.F. DuPont famously said to Charles Hummel, you must get that purse back to Mrs. Kennedy. And so here he is, he's, as he says, he wanted to keep his job at Winterthur. And he and his wife grabbed the purse and set off, and he, is, he knows that he cannot do a high-speed chase of the caravan down Route 52. So he slowly follows the car because they're heading to the airport to board a plane to fly back to Washington. And he's just slowly creeping along so as not to raise concern. They get to a light on 52. Um, the window is rolled down and a hand is extended. Apparently Mrs. Kennedy was in the middle between her two friends. And Marlene, Charlie Hummel's wife, just hands the purse over to the, to the car car speeds off and that is the story. Um, and Charlie was very much a part of this exhibition and we even have a film with Charlie talking about the saving of the purse. Fantastic, there is so much to learn and we're gonna hear much more when we return. I'm Ryan Grover, and I'm the director at Rockwood Park and Museum. And whenever I want to find out about all of my fellow museums and all the fantastic things they collect, I go to the 302. 
Welcome back. Alexandra, I know we talked briefly in the last segment about the dress, and there's a reason why the First Lady wore reproductions, uh, or this reproduction anyway, because she couldn't, everything had to be American made or in the American style, right? Yes, true, and she was very sensitive to that, and it really was part of what she wanted to communicate out about the administration. So even when she does the televised CBS tour, it's really interesting to note how she will ca call out even their glassware on the dinner table made in West Virginia. So very important to her to keep reiterating that this is an American undertaking, whether it was her fashion or redecorating the White House. Now, as part of the exhibit, you have some notes that she made when she was preparing. Can you talk to us a little bit about what she says in the notes? Yes. So she is actually away for the weekend in Virginia right before the filming. And CBS is very nervous about this because she's going to whiz in and do this tour. But in typical Jackie fashion, she's meticulously prepared and she always took notes on these yellow legal pads. And sure enough, in her scrawling hand, she has very detailed notes about what she intends to say. And in between takes, she's studying them. In fact, one of the things that H.F. DuPont always said about her is she was an incredible pupil because she provides very accurate information about the makers of the furniture, the history of the furniture, the history of the spaces, and all of that's in the notes. And those notes came from the JFK Library on loan to us. So it's very personal because those are the notes you see her in some of the photos studying the in-between takes. It was really impressive to have her talk about where something came from, like you said, or the person who donated it. Yes, every name, all of those histories, very, very intentional throughout that tour. And in fact, one of the things that I think CBS, everyone filming it was so shocked by is that it, she did everything in one take. And it's only President Kennedy who comes in at the end and is filmed, who asked to be reshot because uh, as the story goes, when he saw how beautifully his wife had presented everything, he wasn't pleased with his performance. He felt he seemed too wooden and she was so at ease when she was talking about everything in the rooms. So when you take a look at the presentation, she talks so much about um, everything being American, but there was a French influence yes. um, that a lot of people were unaware of, at least initially. Yes, and certainly for presentation to the public of the endeavor, Stéphane Boudin and Maison Johnson were the, fr the French force behind the decoration of the White House, and his role was not inconsequential. So her natural affinity was to the French aesthetic, and there's a tradition of French-inspired objects at the White House. But it's a very funny quote that we have in the exhibition that basically says, oh, that's Mr. Boudin, but we don't introduce him to people. Because the politics of this, the, the diplomacy that was critical to this project, was making sure that this continued to be perceived as an American undertaking. And even though Boudin's role was significant, that was certainly something that the press would have gotten a hold of. And they were looking for reasons, I think, to critique her undertaking. So Stephen Boudin and a few other designers were actually in the wings, but it's H.F. DuPont whose name lends the gravitas to the project. And as part of his work, I guess, everything had to blend in terms of color, and the objects and nothing was supposed to stand out. It was like like a symphony almost. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about his approach to the rooms that we're gonna see in the next segment? Well, to me, the room that really embodies H.F. DuPont's aesthetic the most closely is the green room and that was the first room undertaken. And there's no question that H.F. DuPont, when we talk about him so much being the scholar of American decorative arts, but he also really was a designer through and through. And you really see that in his use of symmetry, in balance, in proportion, his sense of color. And so a lot of the critiques that he's offering as the rooms are evolving it really relate to just his meticulous design sensibility, which is very specific. And as you said, that nothing should jump out at you. And the only way to really achieve that is with optimal proportion and balance. 
um, that he brought to all of his designs at Winterthur, but then was able to translate that to his guidance for the rooms at the White House. Now, he really was uh, the shining star, I guess, of the, the committee, the yes. reason that gave so much um, credibility and just um, enthusiasm to the project. But there was a little bit of conflict. Yes. Right? There was. And so he was very clear that this was Mrs. Kennedy's house, and he was respectful of that. And so as much as he wanted to give guidance, he also ultimately knew that that was her, her home, was their home. So he was respectful in that way, but there certainly was tension because you do have these other players, including Boudin, um, but also Sister Parrish, um, who was a prominent society interior designer of the time, and you have Jane Reitzman, a great collector of French decorative arts, who are all also guiding Mrs. Kennedy. And there are stories of things being rearranged right when, right before Mr. Dupont comes or rearranged by him and then would be put back to different configurations. But in the end, I think what comes through in all the correspondence and even an, an oral history we recently, recently given was an intense mutual respect between Jacqueline Kennedy and H.F. Dupont throughout the process. Because it, it could have gone the other way. Absolutely. 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 And there is debate about, and there could continue to be endless debate about how French are things, how American are things, but in the end some of the quotes really bear out that H.F. Dupont worked incredibly hard on this project. It really was the project of a lifetime for him. He saw it as the ultimate validation of his life, life's work, and I think she felt a tremendous gratitude towards him because without him, arguably, would this have been as successful an undertaking? It, it probably would not have been, no. And I think for us at Winterthur, it was special to, to tell the story that so few people know because what we now know the White House to look like is much of what was created under Jacqueline Kennedy, and that influence is directly connected in with Winterthur. So that putting us on that national stage to this day, that that legacy isn't just here, but it's at the White House, is really, really an important story that we wanted to tell. And a very special story. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see a sample of some of these rooms when we return. My name is Nick Serator. I'm the Exhibitions Director for the Rehoboth Art League, and I love the 302. They bring arts to life. Welcome back. We are now in the red, green, and blue room part of the exhibits. Now, Alexandra, I know that the committee took so such painstaking care to track down historically significant items and to, you know, that really reflected the various um, administrations. But there's one piece in the green room that they probably were a little sorry that they tracked down. Yes, so when this restoration starts getting attention, the White House is flooded with offers of objects. And at that time, another Winterthur connection is that a recent graduate of Winterthur's graduate program is appointed curator. And Lorraine Waxman Pierce is overseeing this and has a tremendous knowledge, particularly of the French influence in America. So what comes their way is this writing desk that is appears to be an iconic Baltimore writing desk with federal style but a French influence. And Jacqueline Kennedy speaks about it extensively in the tour. It's just such a wonderful gift. And if there could be more people giving things like this. And then it's very embarrassing because later it's found to not be to the period. And I will say that it had all the hallmarks of being to the period, including these reverse glass panels that are on it, which Jacqueline Kennedy talks about. And yet it was a mistake, essentially. And it was actually then a political mistake because now they have to do the PR around 
this project that's been touted as having such great integrity and they were duped by a fake. But even H.F. Dupont himself, this is the nature of collecting um, in the world and it, it happens to even some of the greatest collectors. So Mrs. Kennedy wasn't alone sure. in that. I know some of the reproductions are just so good, it's hard to tell. Absolutely, and this reproduction is in a private collection, and it is almost identical to the reproduction that was gifted to the White House. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, the Red Room. Um, it has a, a place of significance in that um, H.F. DuPont collected so many pieces that are on display here every single day, but there was one that he really saw as he really regretted that he didn't bring it into his collection. Yes, there's a very special table that ended up in the Red Room at the White House, and it's the one that got away. And he had tremendous regrets about that. And we had high hopes of getting an exception to the White House policy and actually be, have that on loan and have it be part of the exhibition. But in p large part, thanks to the protections that Jacqueline Kennedy spearheaded, the White House does not lend to any institutions. So we were not able to get the loan of that table. So yet again, HF DuPont was disappointed. It did not, that table did not get to winter tour for the show. Now those protections are to make sure that, you know, as one president goes, they don't take some of the stuff with them. Yes. Um, just to, to keep uh, the White House uh, museum quality, right? Yes, and to this day, the White House continues to have a curator and it continues to have an advisory committee that oversees not the private interiors, but the public interiors. And in fact, a lot of the protections that Mrs. Kennedy put into the White House were so necessary because the White House she saw as a child and the White House she moved into was a product of a complete lack of protection for the objects in, in the White House itself. And so she was finding remarkable objects in fact, one of them being used as a sawhorse, the marble top had been taken off of it, and finding things scattered hither and yon even that were tremendously significant historic objects that had a history in the White House, but that had just by a past administration just been put in the basement or put in a storage room, and so really to safeguard against that happening and really protect the White House from ever getting to the place it was when she moved into it. Now I know that she wanted um, what she created to reflect past administrations, but she felt like it should also be a living sort of thing. Yes. So do presidents since then, do they contribute um, furniture pieces that are indicative of the era that they serve to the White House? To or? some extent, and it does depend on the rooms. There's a lot more freedoms in the rooms that are the private rooms, but yes, and there is redecoration Many of the rooms, out of necessity, need to be redecorated. Each president typically has their own decorator or designer who comes in and works with them on changes. But again, there is a heavy level of vetting in those public spaces. And the reality of any building like the White House is that it's a public space, and so it goes through a level of use that's very different from a museum, so out of necessity, there have to be changes and updates made periodically to the rooms. Sure. Now, I wanted to um, just kind of end our talk by looking at the Blue Room. So much work goes into everything that you do, and it's gorgeous, and we love visiting you. Oh, thank you. Um, so talk to us a little bit about, you know, the significance of the textiles and recreating things that you can't necessarily acquire through lending or purchase. Yes. So. One of the things that we wanted to bring to life is essentially creating spaces that where the design boards for the rooms, much like the design boards Mrs. Kennedy would have seen, almost come to life. And that's really the idea in the green room, the red room, and the blue room. We engaged a woman named Natalie Larson, who's one of the few scholars of window hangings in the historic window hangings in the country and in fact really internationally but she also has done a great deal of work for the White House for multiple administrations so working with Natalie Larson we began recreating many of the textiles that are in the rooms and for the blue room because so much was custom woven for the White House project, particularly by a company called Scalamandre, that there are things we simply couldn't source. And when it came to the blue room, there's a very distinctive trim 
that's on the blue curtains, which we could not have reproduced and by weaving it, but we could have it reproduced by an artist. So that trim is entirely hand painted to replicate exactly as it would have looked in the original Kennedy window hangings. And so that's the kind of detail that we spend so much time creating in these shows. I mean, when you look at the green room, we worked with our floral designers who researched the flowers that Mrs. Kennedy liked. And her favorite flower was the daisy. So you see that the mums and the daisies, these are all arrangements that were created because they're reminiscent of what Mrs. Kennedy had in the green room. So we really do spend untold hours creating as much detail and specificity in each of the choices when we design the shows. And I think maybe not every visitor will realize all those little details, but each one of those details has their little stories behind them. I think that they're definitely going to enjoy each and every one of them. Alexandra, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Jackie, it was a pleasure. We'll be right back. For more information on this or any of the wonderful exhibits here at Winter Tour, you can visit wintertour.org. That'll do it for this week's episode of the 302. We're going to leave you with some beauty shots of the pond in the glade. Until next time, I'm Jackie Ferris. Tell them you saw it on the 302.